congratulations on the book. The stories in here, uh, Everyday Hockey Heroes, um, are amazing. Amazing. It was... I can't remember... I, I think you even said in the intro about smiling. And I caught myself smi- I think it was smiling. Um, I caught myself smiling at a lot of these stories. Um, you know, there are some... There are some sad stories, mm-hmm. but even even those ones are you know make you smile because you know none of the stories sort of end off uh, on a sad note. They 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 end off with hope. It seems uh, in most of them. So awesome book, uh, amazing Thanks. stories in there. And congrats on your semi semi retirement, full retirement. What's the official? yeah semi retirement is probably a good way to put it. There's Busy. Some months are busier than others. This is a busy month, December, with the World Juniors and yeah, that's right. draft rankings that I'm doing. But um, yeah, the, the workload is uh, greatly reduced to a manageable level now. And are, are, you in, are you enjoying this new lifestyle? Yeah, very much so. And um, it's been a weird year, though. I mean, for everybody of course. in the pan- pandemic. So the for lack of a better term, the, the circadian rhythm of a hockey season has kind of gone out the window for everybody. Yeah. And for somebody who anticipated, you know, the way I thought last season was going to end and my last Stanley Cup final and the draft and the NHL awards and sort of a, a victory lap, if you want to call it that, we never really got to do that, which was fine. I mean, yeah, bigger, bigger problems in the world than, than that. But um, it, it was weird. And then everything felt off balance in the summer. You Normally, I would have been shut down on July 2nd, but then I was working until August. And then I semi-retired, but the Stanley Cup playoffs were going on until late September, early October. And in the off-season was October and November, and that's kind of <laughs> weird. And, and here we are in December, and they're still not you know, playing NHL hockey. So it's kind of a, a bizarre circumstance. For everybody, I guess, but yeah. uh, and it's not quite how I envisioned uh, retire semi retirement would end or start or whatever. But nevertheless, here we are. Yeah. What What are you doing um, to to fill in your days that that you weren't doing as much of when you were working full time? Well, I mean, you kind of just get to live a little bit. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, the the job was great, and I loved it. Yeah, but it, it was all consuming for the most part. In other words, the vast majority of pretty much every day, certainly mm, 10 months of the year, um, from the moment you woke up in the morning until whenever you went to bed at night. And oftentimes it was waking up early in the morning and going to bed late at night. Mm-hmm. Um, you were consumed by things that needed to be done or chased or followed or there were games to be watched. There were radio hits to do in the morning. There was knowledge to be had. And you felt like you had to know as much about everything as humanly possible. So no matter what you had in your personal life calendar, uh, it could be a family get together. It could be a wedding. It could be dinner. It could be a birthday celebration. It could be holidays. It could be anything. You never really truly got to live in the moment because there was always some other moment that you were kind of more interested in or felt obliged to be more interested in. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, might as well ask it now rather than later. But I mean, I remember when you were, was it the editor of the hockey news? Editor in chief of the hockey news. Yeah. Editor chief of the hockey news. Um, and then obviously on, on TSN, uh, insiders and and really like everywhere you yeah. look when it was hockey and TSN was you know there 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 you were when you started off covering the NHL and covering hockey um, things obviously have changed so so much um, in terms of information um, I can imagine you being someone that people went to to give you know information to and then over the past maybe decade or decade or so, I can see it sort of reversing where there's so many places where you can go for information that it, it might have changed. But I'm curious, like what major changes were there um, that, that you saw in terms of whether it is finding out who's getting traded or 
uh, just, you know, things that, that you were the first to break? Like how, what changed in your business? Everything, <laughs> literally everything. I mean, listen, when, when I started in the business, there was no internet. If mm. you wanted to know yeah. what was going on in another city in the National Hockey League, you had to pick up a phone, not a cell phone, a hardline phone, and <laughs> dial a hardline number at the other end to talk to a reporter in another city or to talk to somebody who worked for a team or whatever the case may be. But, you know, back when I started in, in the 80s, um, well, I started in the 70s covering junior hockey, but covering the NHL in the 80s, um, every hockey columnist used to do Sunday notes columns and the Sunday notes column would be information you would call from other reporters or other cities over the course of the week. So you might call somebody on a Tuesday and get a, a nugget about the Pittsburgh Penguins on Tuesday and you, you would hold on to it until Sunday Wow! and put it, and put it in your notebook. I, I, I can remember very clearly even in the nineties working at the Toronto star and, you know, finding out to, from calling to Pittsburgh or whatever, that something that about Mario Lemieux's injury that nobody else really had. And, and you know, that's unheard of in today's, you know, people live tweet practices. Now, if somebody blocks a shot in practice and goes to the dressing room, you know about it in real yeah. time. So the whole, the, the whole business is completely and utterly revolutionized. And um, so, you know, the, 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 I could, I could go on for hours about what changed, what changed for the better, what changed for the worse. Um, how I, I, I found my, I, I feel like I found my niche because of the inefficiencies of of the market when when technology changed and that you know I was able in in some instances because of who I was and who I worked for at the time to maybe seize upon you know a, a, a better way to to disseminate information more quickly and maybe other some other outlets were slower to it and I gained a huge advantage in my industry for a brief period of time because of that, but mm. it helped in kind of forging who I was and what I did. Yeah. That's uh, that's fascinating. It's, it sort of reminds me when you were talking about they're picking up a, a phone wired into a wall. Uh, there's that scene in Moneyball where, you know, he's getting his secretary to make calls, call the general manager of this. And he's picking up the, yeah. the phone. I'm going, how does that, how is that efficient? <laughs> 